Hello Church, in this video we're continuing our video series on the attributes of God. In this video we're looking specifically at the attribute of God's holiness, which is sort of a hard one to describe, it's sort of a hard one for us to wrap our minds around, and yet we see it all throughout the Bible as we're reading about who God is and how he is uh, working in the world and in our lives. A couple definitions that we can start to try to put this together and get our minds around what it means that God is holy. You can see here a couple de definitions. It's his perfection. It's his otherness or his being set apart. God is wholly different from who we are. That difference is his holiness. Theologian John Frame said that God's holiness is God's capacity and right to arouse our reverent awe and wonder. Or we might say, I'm going to say a couple times in the rest of this video, that God's holiness is the godness of God. It's what makes him God, his perfection, his moral perfection, his uniqueness. There is no one like our God, and that's what it means for God to be holy. One of the things that, that theologians have said for centuries is that all of God's moral attributes are sort of under that umbrella of his holiness. So what it means for God to be perfectly loving and perfectly just, what it means for God to be merciful or have wrath against sin and wickedness, that comes from his holiness. We know as we read the Bible that God is perfectly loving in a way that we are not. That's because he is holy. He's perfectly just in a way we are not. That comes from his holiness. And so really as we look at God's holiness, there's sort of two aspects that uh, we might have in mind when the Bible talks about God's holiness. There's this relational quality that there is no one like him that he is set apart. And then there's also this moral quality that he is perfect and that he is without sin. There is no sin or wrongdoing in anything that God does. And so when we talk about those moral attributes of God being loving and merciful, that comes from that moral quality of who God is. A couple of quotes here uh, that get at this idea of God's holiness. A.A. A. Hodge said, The holiness of God is not to be conceived of as one attribute among others, it is rather a general term representing the conception of God's consummate perfection and total glory. It is his infinite moral perfection crowning his infinite intelligence and power. Sort of a, a, a heavy quote there, gives you a lot to think about. But that's starting to get at what God's holiness is. It's sort of an, an all-encompassing attribute of who God is and everything that he is. Similarly, R.L. Dabney said, Holiness is to be regarded not as a distinct attribute, but as a result of all God's moral perfection together. When we think about who God is, that is his holiness. We read about God's holiness all throughout the Bible. I just picked out a couple verses here that, that get to it. Exodus 15.11, Who is like you, majestic in holiness? Or 1 Samuel 2.2, 2, There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. Or Isaiah 43.15, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. So God is Creator, God is King, God is holy and set apart. One thing that we'll see is God's holiness is the reason why he's deserving of our worship. There is no one like our God. There is no other God in the universe but God. That is because he is holy. He is perfect. He is set apart and not like us. For the bulk of the time in this video, I want to talk about these two passages in the Bible where God is referred to as holy, holy, holy. They come from Isaiah and from Revelation, sort of the, the Old Testament and the very end of the New Testament. And the reason it's important to look at these two, two images, these two um, scripture passages, is because that holy, 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 in the Hebrew, when a word is, is repeated three times like that, it, it often speaks to the superlative of that word. 
So for something to be holy, holy, holy is for that thing to be the most holy, the most set apart. And these are the two places in the Bible when that phrase, holy, 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 is used, both in visions looking at who God is in his eternal heavenly temple. Let me turn there and read these two passages to you. First, this Isaiah 6 passage, starting in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the torpos and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. A few things there. When we, when we read of the seraphim, uh, those are uh, angels. Similar to when we read Revelation, they're called living creatures. Uh, often in the Bible, they're portrayed as these terrifying beings uh, covered in flames. And yet those terrifying heavenly beings are covering their face um, to avoid looking at God's glory straight on. They have a supernatural power, yet they are afraid to look clearly upon God. Again, we see that, that phrase, holy, 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 there. The, the seraphim are looking to God as this most holy being. And the idea, the picture of this is that all of the glory and all of the earth belong to this God who created it along with all things. I included this last verse, chapter, uh, verse 7, in our discussion for this video because we see here a promise of the gospel message. That it is because of God's holiness that he's going to save his people who are not deserving to be saved. We in and of ourselves are not clean. We are not holy. Yet one who is holy is going to save his people in a way that they could not. Again, God's holiness represents both his love and his justice as he seeks to save and cleanse his people. You might take a moment if you're watching this at home and ask, what's, what's the meaning of this image from Isaiah? Why does the Bible give us this picture of who God is and the seraphim bowing down before him in his heavenly realm? I think one of the answers is that we certainly don't understand God enough, do we? Uh, not that we can fully understand him, but we also don't fully grasp what it means that God is holy and that he's deserving of our praise, that our lives, like the, like the seraphim in that passage, need to be lived as bowing down before God because of who he is. I think the more we understand what it means that God is holy, the more our lives reflect that bowing down and following after him. R.C. Sproul said this, If you don't delight in the fact that your father is holy, 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 then you are spiritually dead. You may be in a church, you may go to a Christian school, but if there is no delight in your soul for the holiness of God, you don't know God, you don't love God, you're out of touch with God, you're asleep to his character. Strong words from uh, R.C. Sproul there, but that gets to the point that God's holiness, he's so unique that we often feel like we can't know him and we don't understand him, yet he has revealed himself to us in his world and in his word. And the picture that the seraphim give us there is that because he is holy, he deserves for us to, to cover our eyes and bow down before him um, in worship, in reverence, and in awe. Let's go and read that other passage in the Bible where holy, holy, holy appears. This is Revelation 4. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. 
At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne there were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders clothed in white garments, with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and pearls of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Again, take a moment and just pause and consider what this picture means to us today. We see the, the seraphim bowing down before God, similar to the Isaiah vision. Here they, they lay down their crowns at his feet. It's a symbol of God's supreme authority. Again, it gets back to the question of why do we praise God in the first place? It's because of everything that we've been talking about in this attribute series. Because he's all-powerful. Because he's all-knowing. Because he's the holy creator and the king of the entire universe. He alone is deserving of our praise because he alone is God. Again, holiness gets at the very godness of God. We can also see the holiness of God in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Again, Jesus is God. He, never, he doesn't cease to be God when he's walking on the earth. And so one commentator says that God isn't just holy in heaven, but God's holiness held up on earth as well. That is, in the life of Jesus, when he's surrounded by sin and darkness, he remains perfectly holy, perfectly set apart, perfectly without sin, because that's just who God is. Again, that's something amazing about the life of Jesus, that he was tempted just as we are, yet was without sin. Likewise, Jesus, because he is holy, is deserving of praise. He's without sin. He has power and authority that doesn't come from from just the fact that he's without sin, it comes from the fact that he is holy, that he is God. In God's holiness, we see the sum of love and justice, his wrath, his power, authority, all of his attributes. And we see those things in Jesus on the cross, don't we? On the cross, we see God's love and justice meet, as we often say. That God is loving, but he also must punish sin. And those things happen on the cross in the body of Jesus, where he is paying for our sins, yet also saving us to an eternity with God, abundant life, both now and forever, because he loves us. On the cross, sin is punished, yet sinners are saved. So God's holiness is central to our understanding of the gospel because it gets to the very nature of who God is. It's a lot for us to think about. That's a lot for us to wrap our minds around. But again, that's just the picture of God's holiness that the Bible gives us from beginning to end. Let me end this video with three so what's. Why does holiness matter to us? The first is what we've said, that holiness is the very godness of God. The fact that God is God and we are not, that God is God and there is no other God like him, that's because he is holy. Like the, the kings in Revelation, the seraphim in Isaiah and Revelation, God's holiness causes us to worship him. He is worthy of our praise because he is holy. One commentator says, God's love is in no sense uh, in conflict with his holiness, righteousness, justice, or even his wrath. All of God's attributes are in perfect harmony. Everything God does is loving, 
just as everything he does is just and right. We can worship and praise God because of who he is and what he's done for us in Christ. He can do those things because he is holy. And the last is, I thought of the word precious. Um, precious gets to his uniqueness, his, his eternal, infinite value that there's no one else like him. Here's what theologian Herman Bavinck said. God is the sum total of all his perfections, the one than whom no greater, higher, or better can exist, either in thought or reality. God, in other words, fully answers to the idea of God. He also has perfect knowledge of himself and has instilled in our hearts an impression of himself. Every attribute of God is precious to believers. Take a moment, take a few moments, and think about that last line. As we've gone through this series, our purpose hasn't just been for, for head knowledge, that we can learn more about who God is, though that's part of it. But also, all of these attributes that we have been talking about ought to be precious to us as believers, because this it, it's us getting to know our Creator and our Savior, that He's revealed Himself to us and acted in our lives. It's really a beautiful thing. It should be precious in our lives. And again, it's reason that we praise God and worship God and follow Him with our lives. I'd encourage you, this is just skimming the sur surface of God's holiness. Um, as you read your Bible, as you, as you study, be on the lookout for ways in which we see God's holiness um, in his attributes, in his actions, in the, in the life of Jesus. What does it mean that God is perfect, that he's set apart, that he is God? That's what it means that God is holy, and that's the reason that we can praise him today.